disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. We talk about people building the future rooted into what we're doing today, looking down the road to tomorrow and trying to make sense of it all. There's a lot of stuff coming at you. There's a lot of things uh, on the horizon and, and we're busy enough. I've got four kids. I'm busy enough just trying to get my kids dressed and out the door. So we're here to help digest this stuff give some tangible takeaways. Our topic today is amazing in light of our quantum season and what happens when quantum computers figure out how to break stuff. Mark, how are you feeling, man? <laughs> Overwhelmed with stringing these episodes together. It's an amazing quantum season. And today, today bridges my two interests. So my writing is all about blockchain and crypto quantum season my my curiosity is all about quantum so this episode will combine those two um, interests i'm very excited ab about it i think there's a little disclaimer so we're going to be talking about post-quantum cryptography we as we've said we're quantum dangerous we're crypto dangerous so we're gonna be using some acronyms that we probably don't understand so bear with us we'll be trying to explain these different types of cryptography as we go so um, if if anything you don't get anything just leave a comment and we'll get back to you with those with those answers but yeah looking forward to it jeremy have you have you done your homework uh yes i have i have done my homework i always do my homework mark good um yeah so so post quantum cryptography before we bring our guest on literally this is this is this is the point in time on the horizon where quantum computers have figured out how to how to unlock what uh cryptography does to protect things kind of in a in a very basic basic realm so we're looking at a point in the future um that's either cryptography has to change a little bit or regulations have to do something to make sure things don't happen. I don't know. There's a whole things, a whole bunch of things that we can explore. But instead of me pontificating, let's bring in the expert, Mark. Yeah, yeah let's bring in. A, hopefully, we'll get to make some real sense of some of the news stories of late as well about cryptography being cracked and or not. So yeah, welcome. Our guest is Laurie Thorpe from IBM. She's going to be speaking to us about uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology standards for post-quantum cryptography and how the industry is collaborating together to make those a reality, how different industries can prepare, how what they should be preparing for, and lots of other things. So welcome to the show, Laurie, and thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And Excellent. We've got in, we're in England this week, so we've gone from America now we're in England. So um, that's good news for our English fans, Jeremy. That's right. That's right. So quickly, so but before we jump in, Laurie, on on the carryover question from from the last show, we had D Wave on uh, quantum computing, one of the earliest um, players in in the quantum computing game. Give us just a touch of background. I, I looked at your I looked at your background a little bit, and it's you've done a lot in the telecom world. Right. So give us give us how you give us a little background about your experience in telecom and how that translated into security and privacy protection and all that good stuff. Sure. So, um, yeah, so my background is definitely in telecom many, many decades. Um, the uh, I've been working in the telco space since the very early days of mobile. So I've lived through all of the various Gs, so from 2G from to 3G to 4G to 5G. Um, for many years, I was a solution architect, and uh, security was always um, very much part of uh, part of the remit. Um, since I've joined IBM, I've been um, working in the context of the the IBM Quantum team, looking at what is the impact both of quantum computing on telco and looking at the potential benefits that quantum can bring to telecommunications, but also then looking at what does post-quantum cryptography mean, how the telcos can um, protect themselves and continue to guarantee the security, the privacy that everybody expects from the connectivity that we, that we rely so much on today. And that is sort of one of the things that I've been doing over the last few years. 
2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. I remember the early days. It must have been a very interesting process to be part of it always it was moving so quickly is it still moving as quickly now as it was when we, the progression from 2g to 3g um i i think that you know at the time and to give you a, a, an anecdote when i started working in telco um my mom was asking me you know why would anybody want a phone that they bring that they bring with them um <laughs> you know you've got a phone at home why would you want to bring a phone with you what's wrong with you um, so that gives a little bit of a measure of how much things have, have actually changed. Um, I think that Telco is in probably a, a, a challenging place at the moment in terms of its evolution and the, the business model that has sustained it um, up until now, which I think now is, is facing some, some sort of challenges. Um, but I still think it's a hugely exciting place. And I also think, you know, we, we shouldn't just be thinking of telco as our phones. We need to be thinking of telco as an enabler for digitalization. Uh, it's an enabler for digital society, for digital economy. And, um, and that is really what makes a lot of this really exciting because we're not talking about a single sector. We're really talking about um, a capability that enables everything we do as a society. It, it literally is the connected tissue for, for the digital experience, right? So if you don't have that, we can't have these interactions back and forth. We can't collaborate. We can't share data. We can't work with data. We can't pull it in. We can't push it out. Like, yeah, it's, it's really, really good to think about it from, from that perspective. Um, so let's let's do the let's do the carryover question i know we're i know we're changing um going from telco to healthcare real quick but i wanted to do this do this handoff because like we always like stitching these shows together so mark ask that carryover question we had from d-wave from last week yeah murray tom um, head of evangelism at d-wave quantum his question for you was about cybersecurity from different perspective. And he was particularly interested in the healthcare industry. And his question was, what advice do you, IBM, or the, the greater community provide for healthcare professionals? And what should they be doing to prepare um, short-term and long-term? So healthcare is an interesting one because if we think of the sensitivity of the data that's involved, and we think of the long-term impact of that, um, healthcare is actually one of the sectors that really needs to be thinking about how to protect data, not just um, against a, a future quantum computer, but how do we ensure that data isn't harvested now to be then decrypted later? And the recommendation I would have is to start looking now at first of all, a plan for post-quantum cryptography going forward, but also how to protect some of that long shelf life, important data that um, that sort of people rely on being kept safe. I've got a silly question already, Jeremy. <laughs> that didn't take long, but silly questions are the best. <laughs> um, something you just said then, you said you don't want the data to be harvested now, to be decrypted mm -hmm. later. And I hadn't really thought about it in that way. So we'll get into this. And again, apologies for we're jumping around a little bit with if the cryptography is updated at a later date, if it's changed to encrypt the data, but if they have the data now that's encrypted in a certain way and the quantum evolves that it can crack this cryptography, but it can't crack what comes later, if they already have this data that's encrypted in this way, obviously the, the data can't be back encrypted so it, they would be able to hack what they have now and that would be the same across industries so military as well so is that yes. right okay that is right um and that's why when we talk about um post-quantum cryptography often people think that this is a problem for the future so a lot of people ask the question of when will a cryptographically relevant quantum computer appear um, which in my view is the wrong question because we don't know for certain, we don't have a definite date. So if we think of the comparison with Y2K, there isn't a corresponding, you know, 31st of December, 1999 at 1159, that's, that's your sort of D-Day. 
Um, here, it's a little bit more uncertain. Um, but I think what we need to be doing is thinking about what are the things that we can do now to mitigate something that we know is going to happen because we are seeing quantum computers that are evolving. We are seeing um, algorithms that are being optimized, which mean that actually maybe some of these capabilities will, will actually appear sooner than, than people expect. And the harvest now decrypt later, once data is stolen, and even if it's encrypted, so it can't necessarily be decrypted immediately, but once a cryptographically relevant quantum computer is available, then it can be decrypted. And once it's stolen, it's stolen. So, you know, there's not a lot that we can do with data that's been stolen, which is why we need to be thinking about that data that has a longer shelf life. Um, we need to be protecting it now. We, we, we shouldn't be waiting for a cryptographically relevant quantum computer to be appearing because then it will be too late. Then you need to call the lawyers. Yeah, so absolutely. So IBM talks to, is relied upon by a lot of large companies for technological advice and foresight and, and, and all of that stuff. Herein lies the challenge with some of these large, actually all companies really. So you have an IT organization that, um, you know, isn't always funded necessarily the way that IT organization would want to be funded, right? Because they're they're getting all these directives and like, hey, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And then the money that comes to them is not always matching what needs to what needs to be done so a lot of things can get pushed off right so if if, it, if there's no immediate threat then it's kind of like all right well we can wait we can wait we can wait how are you um how are you helping bring in the focus now for some of that stuff because are you seeing some of the challenges like oh we've got plenty of time on this and how are you dealing with some of those conversations so there are different different aspects to um, to how we're we're dealing with it. So the first is working very closely with um, with government, with policymakers, with regulators um, to help them understand and gain awareness of of the threat. Um, we're also working very closely with our clients to ensure that there is an understanding and awareness. I think the awareness piece is really, really critical because um, I think once it is understood, then um, you know the the right decisions can be made based on risk appetite, based on business priorities. So we are aware that obviously. There are a lot of priorities and a lot of the, particularly the security organizations um, are under a lot of pressure because they're seeing a lot of threats that are materializing and some potentially they'll, they'll be seeing them as more imminent than the quantum threat. Um, but I think raising awareness is a really critical part of the work that we do. Um, I, I, I know we'll be talking about this a little Later, but the other aspect is we uh, the industry level engagement, and here IBM has has put a lot of effort into working with different industries, and basically again raising that awareness, but also coalescing around um, how to act as an industry because a lot of these capabilities are not going to be these problems are not going to be solved by one individual company. Uh, it will take, you know, as it, as it were, it takes a village. Uh, we need to ensure that we have the supply chain lined up. We need to align with regulation and government, and we need to ensure that, you know, that all of these different elements fall into place. So if we think of standards, if we think of supply chain, um, if we think of the products that we're expecting, these are all things be somehow um, aligned and coordinated, and that takes effort. And IBM has taken a very, um, very central role in bringing together industries to be able to um, to be able to to do that. Mark, you talk about uh, recently in the last couple of shows you referenced. Um, something happened. Something that happened with some researchers in in Shanghai that that cracked. Uh, of some kind of cryptography. Are, are, 
Lori, are you familiar with that? And and what are your what are your thoughts on what happened there, and what does that mean? Well, I think we've over over the last sort of few years, we've been seeing a lot of a lot of announcements. Um, you know, some some more accurate than others. Uh, I think the paper that you're referring to was uh, was later sort of analyzed and sort of disproved. Um, there had been some some errors made in the in the calculation at a certain step of of the way. I think at the the seventh step there was an error in the calculation. So the papers basically said, you know, we've we've cracked our essay and. Um, and I think what that shows is that there are a lot of people that are thinking about this. This is something that a lot of people are thinking about and are working on. So the fact that that particular paper was disproved, that doesn't mean that um, that others are working on this. And it doesn't mean that maybe the next time, actually, there won't be an error in the paper and we will actually have to potentially accelerate when, when we thought that um, that this was going to be possible. I think that, so from what, what I know, so they cracked a 20 digit or something RSA code, but in reality, RSA is like 2000 bit um, cryptography and then obviously it's exponentially higher, so it's nowhere near that. But that's a nice segue, maybe... So I, I, I'm from I'm from crypto and Bitcoin uses uh, elliptic curve um, cryptography or something. Yeah, there are different types of cryptography. Maybe we could just for our more advanced or for our beginners as well. Maybe outline three or four of the most commonly used cryptographies, including that one of Bitcoin and the RSA. Maybe a little bit in how they how they differ and how susceptible they are to attack or being mm -hmm. hacked first and then move on to the kind of standards that NIST are trying to build around those? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing we can start with is um, what is what is um, sort of majorly affected um, by the quantum threat is public key cryptography. So um, there has been some work done on symmetric key cryptography. Um, we believe it's less sensitive to the, the quantum threat, even though there will need to be some work done to ensure that the key lengths are, um, are sort of fit for purpose, which, you know, even now in some cases, um, you know, we've, we've sort of left cryptography, left um, sort of old cryptography in there and haven't necessarily been, been actively managing um, that maybe as well as as we could have when we talk about different algorithms that will be affected so when we look at public key cryptography ultimately think of rsa think of elliptic uh, elliptic curve uh cryptography think of diffie hellman these are some examples of the cryptography that will be affected by a cryptographically relevant quantum computer um, these are the algorithms, but obviously then the implementation of the algorithms, not, not all algorithms are created equal and not all implementations are created equal. And that is also why we can't just give a single D-Day or Q-Day, um, as it were, um, around when cryptography will be, will be compromised. Um, I think one thing maybe to think about is that obviously when um, when the first cryptographically relevant quantum computers will become available, um, to be able to crack cryptography, it will be um, potentially quite an expensive and quite a difficult thing to do. Then as time goes on and the capabilities sort of become more democratized, then it will become easier and cheaper to crack cryptography, which may also determine what are which which are going to be the targets of that that cryptography if that makes sense yeah i i don't remember who was on the show mark that that kind of put this thought in my brain but it's it's kind of more about you know instead of taking 10 years and a hundred million dollars to break you know cryptography maybe it'll take seven and like 50 million dollars and maybe five and 
30 million dollars right so like the appeal to try it might start to be uh, a little bit more palatable for the uh, malcontents out there maybe <laughs> the malcontents well th that's their incentives i think that was um equal one that put that um jason lynch i think he put that in your in well your done well done okay well let's let's move on to the to the um to the nist work that that you've been doing and and maybe give us a, a high level detail about some of the outputs that you're starting to see as it would relate to a uh, a chief technology officer at a at an organization mm -hmm. okay so i guess the first thing is uh nist stands for the national institute of standards and technology um nist um a few years ago back in 2016 they initiated a program which is the post-quantum cryptography program. And the intention of that program is basically to standardize algorithms that are resistant, not just to classical computers, but also to quantum computers. Um, so that process, um, the, it's, it's very much a global process and it has involved um, a lot of, a lot of sort of entities from all over the world. Um, this includes sort of the, the entire sort of global cryptography uh, community, if you like. And what they did is they, they put out a call for proposals um, for algorithms that they could standardize. And when they first started this process, I think initially there were something along the lines of uh, around 80 algorithms that were submitted. Now, that process, it lasted for many years because what NIST has done, they've done a fantastic job of basically looking at the security of the algorithms, but also looking at things like the, uh, the performance of the algorithms in, a, in an attempt to standardize the best ones. Um, what has happened recently which is very exciting for, for us, is we've reached a first milestone where they've standardized the first three post-quantum cryptography algorithms. Uh, and this happened at the end of August. Um, those first three algorithms are, um, we're, we're happy to say that IBM was co-developer uh, in two of those three algorithms. So they selected these algorithms um, where the, the draft standards were issued. Now we have the, uh, the standards. And what that means is that effectively, we've got a first set of standards that we can start to implement into products, into protocols, um, to be able to start to make our systems quantum safe. So it's a, it's a huge milestone for us. Uh, very, very excited because obviously this is, if you like, it's, it's a starting point for the implementation. And can those three algorithms be used today in, if somebody made another WhatsApp, for example, it could be incorporated into that as a, a means of encryption. If somebody made a new, a new meme coin on Solana, it, they could use that encryption to today to make, and, and would that be quantum resistant to an indefinite future or a hundred years, a thousand years or forever? Well, I think, I mean, security is saying that something is indefinitely secure is, is always, um, is always challenging. You know, there, there's always, uh, I think it's, it's tempting fate in some ways. Um, everything is secure until it isn't. So <laughs> we could argue that, uh, the, the algorithms have gone through very, very rigorous testing, and we have absolute confidence that, that they are secure. It doesn't mean that they'll be indefinitely secure. And maybe later we can, we can talk a little bit about crypto agility, because I think, we, I think that's a really important part of the, um, the whole post-quantum cryptography um, discussion. Um, but fundamentally, yes, the, the answer to your question is yes, we can start to implement them. In fact, um, in the case of IBM, we started um, a couple of years ago, we implemented what then became one of the standardized algorithms we started to implement in our mainframe, in our Z16 
um, platform. And this was really um, a great, first of all, a great learning curve because understanding how to implement the algorithms is sort of going to be, you know, part of, of, of that, that journey um, towards, a, towards a, a quantum safe um, architecture. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the short answer is definitely we should be starting to implement them. And even if we look at what, for example, um, Apple have done recently, so they have implemented um, a hybrid scheme in the iMessaging um, solution, and they are using the post-quantum cryptography algorithms that have then since been standardized. Okay. Wow. Now, Mark, no, no Apple rants today. We're going to have nice. to hold you back on the Apple rants, but you, uh, so Laurie, you had me. No, um, that's a, that's a plus one. I think for Apple that, like, that kind of, like they've gained a bit more, a bit of their respect back. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Um, Laurie, you, you had my curiosity peaked at crypto agility. Can yes. you explain, can you explain that? Yeah. Let's not yeah, wait. So, <laughs> so crypto agility, it's so we've been very very fortunate over sort of the last few the last few years the last few decades the the cryptography that we've been using has actually has actually um held up very very well um and you know with the, obviously with the few exceptions there the uh we have done some cryptography migration but actually there's a lot of cryptography out there that that has held up for decades and that is really good news but um what it's also done is it's put us in a situation where potentially we may have become a little bit um what's the word uh complacent in how we manage cryptography so one of the big challenges that we have today and we're seeing this across different industries um one of the big challenges that we have is that we don't necessarily know where and how cryptography is being used in the systems that we use today. And this is doubly true in the sectors where there's a lot of legacy. So if we think of if we think of financial services or we think of telco, where potentially you have um, multiple generations of technology that are being sort of built one on top of the other, um, knowing where that cryptography is actually being used and how it's being used, that is not at all obvious. Um, now, what does that mean? It means that if something happens where the cryptography needs to be changed, like it, as is the case for the quantum threat, the first thing we need to do is understand where we're using the cryptography, um, understand how relevant it is in terms of what it's protecting, what would be the business impact of, of sort of if that cryptography were to, were to fail. Um, but also it means that we're not really in a position to very quickly swap out cryptography and going forward, the um, quantum, becoming quantum safe is a little bit of a catalyst to maybe managing cryptography better going forward and ensuring that we're building security in a way that is able to, um, in an agile way, respond to threats going forward, whether it's a quantum threat or whether it's a, a different threat. Um, and that's why we're really building that crypto agility message as part of the, the, of the, the um, quantum safe um, journey. Very yeah, interesting. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you saw, but I, I, I don't know if it's kind of crypto agility, but Vitalik Buterin was talking about with Ethereum that one of their post-quantum solutions is to hard fork Ethereum. And then I guess they would input, I don't know what data, reprogram it with this new algorithm to make it quantum. So cool. um, do you mind if I push back? So, and although this question isn't really very useful now because what you said about kind of stealing the data and decrypting later makes it a little bit less valid i think i think that's for me that's the big takeaway is that it doesn't actually matter how good the cryptography gets in the future if you steal the data now you can decrypt it and obviously some of the information that you steal it will be diluted over time but a lot of it won't be and if it's however many years in the future if you get hold of it if the wrong people if the nefarious parties get hold of it then 
it could be um, d detrimental to everything. Um, I want to just read, um, it's from a, I'm not sure who it's from. It says, current estimates are that quantum cracking of a single 2048-bit RSA key would require a computer with 20 million qubits running in superposition for about eight hours. Okay. The um, the coverage of the September, so those Shanghai researchers, is essentially overblown because symmetric encryption, unlike RSA and other asymmetric siblings, is widely believed to be safe from quantum computing. As long as bit sizes are sufficient, uh, PQC, post-quantum cryptography experts, are confident that AES-256 will resist all known quantum attacks. Is there a threat of overblowing the threat or, or are we not like well, over, I mean, are we overblowing the potential danger of this i mean that is kind of a million dollar question um but i guess maybe just to to the point that you made around the um aes 256 so there are two i i mentioned earlier around symmetric and asymmetric cryptography so the, um, the main risk that we see um, around a cryptographically relevant quantum computer is down to Shor's algorithm. And that's why it affects asymmetric cryptography um, mainly. Um, that doesn't mean that um, symmetric cryptography will be completely unaffected. And I think that you're right. I think we need to be looking at key length and we need we need to be making sure that there is sort of sufficient, you know, that we've got sufficiently long key length um, implemented. Um, now, does that mean it's 100% sort of, you know, we, we can definitely say 100% that um, it won't be affected? Again, I think that's always a dangerous thing to be doing when we talk about when we talk about security. So I think a lot of these things, we need to be looking at uh, what is really the art of the possible and how that evolves and what are the things that are actually causing that risk to, to materialize. So on one side, obviously, you've got the evolution of the performance of quantum computers. You'll have um, things like error mitigation and error correction that is evolving and um, quantum computers are becoming more and more powerful. And you've also got ultimately algorithms uh, that are being optimized and that are becoming more effective and more efficient at, at doing certain things. And I think the combination of all of these things happening, um, you don't know what it is that is actually going to cause, for example, something to all of a sudden become possible. I don't know if that has really answered answered your question. Um, is there a risk of this being overblown? Um, maybe, maybe there is. Um, but on the other hand, we need to be thinking about, you know, are we, are we ready to, to take that risk? And then going back to the harvest now decrypt later, I mean, that risk is, it's here now. So, depending on what data you're sitting on, what, what is the data that you're protecting? If the data has a, a short shelf life, then you might say, well, actually, I don't see it as a huge risk. But if the data that, um, that you're protecting is data that is going to be relevant in 10 years time, so if we think of healthcare, if we think of defense, if we think of some of the areas where, you know, data is really, you know, these are the crown jewels, um, you know, it depends how gung ho you want to be with uh, with your security and and with um, and with the the data that that you've been you've been tasked to protect. Yeah, yeah, that I think that's the key. I was going to ask Jeremy to to paint his worst case scenario, and if you're if you're taking the risk and of that coming to reality to fruition, then yeah, why take the risk? Yeah, the, well, so. I think the Sorry, go ahead. No, please. Um, no, I was just going to say that the other thing maybe to consider is that the implementation of post-quantum cryptography, this isn't something that we are going to do next week. This is something that takes a significant amount of effort and time. 
Um, so one of the things that we are doing is um, looking at how we can make it more efficient, more effective and more secure. And really the answer to that is the sooner you start in that process, the better you'll be able to manage the journey. So if you think of how you can, for example, combine your post-quantum cryptography transformation with other technology transformations that are going on uh, in parallel anyway, that is sort of uh, one of the areas where actually you can do it a lot more efficiently if you start early rather than waiting, waiting and then having to sort of do it either in a rush or um, sort of go back and, and fix things that that you're that you're building today so one of the things you don't want to do is be is to build more cryptographic debt what do you mean by cryptographic debt i think i know where you're going but what do you mean by that so if i'm um implementing a new widget and um i have the opportunity to um to put for example, to secure it against a quantum risk, so to implement post-quantum cryptography and secure it against a post-quantum uh, quantum risk, um, that means I won't be increasing the, the cryptographic debt. If I'm implementing the new widget and I decide that I'm just going to put old cryptography in there, classical cryptography in there, that means that at some point I need to go back and change that cryptography. So there is a case for, particularly if we think, you know, I'll, I'll go back to telco. Um, if we think of the next generation of telco capabilities, um, I want to be implementing post-quantum cryptography from the start. So one thing that I don't want to do in the case of, for example, 5G evolution or 6G is to implement classic cryptography that I then need to go back and change because that will effectively, that will cost a lot more as well as, as sort of having an impact in terms of effort. So where possible, we want to be building post-quantum cryptography into any new capabilities that we that we implement um, as soon as possible. Yeah, it's like, Mark, Mark, you go into the pub and just keep putting everyone's tab on your credit card and then dealing with it down the road. Yeah, it's, um, it's always gonna come back and bite you in the air. Uh... That's right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like that. And you know, where, where my head's going with a lot of this and I've got a, I've got a fun thought experiment that we could run into if you're, if you're up for it, and then maybe we can deal with our deal with our takeaway question. But what I, what I gathered from listening to you is the, the idea of like the, the cryptographic, you know, agility kind of thing is really interesting because, you know, it, it's no longer a set it and forget it kind of thing. It's no longer, Hey, did you click the encrypt, you, you know, click the security button? Are you doing your thing? Yeah. It's just kind of good. It's more of, Hey, we put something in today, but we got to monitor it. And maybe there are some things that we could do on a monthly basis to increase that, to add code to it, to do something a little bit better with that. Right. Um, so I thought that was an interesting takeaway because a lot of people are just like, yeah, my stuff's encrypted. Well, let's unpack that a little bit and, 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 and see. So that's really cool. All right. My thought experiment for you and, you know, no is a perfectly acceptable uh, response to this, but <laughs> let's, let's imagine, let's imagine during this, during this interview, you get a call like a, a, a WhatsApp just pops up and, and it goes, Hey, um, yeah, Lori. So here's what's happening right now. It's like your NIST, your buddies from NIST. Uh, so it looks like, uh, they figured out a date. It's going to be November 1st, 2031. Quantum is going to be all cryptography. Um, that's where we are. We got to get to work. How are we sitting today? And, you know, what would the message be to everybody if we now have like the asteroid date, you know, up and running as right. November 1st, 2031? Well, to be honest, I, I think the answer, regardless of whether we have a date or not, I think the answer would be um, the same, maybe with a slightly different senses of urgency, but I think the answer would be the same. Um, I mean, the recommendation would be start to get a plan together. Um, start to do an analysis of where you're using cryptography, how you're using cryptography. And I mentioned this earlier, um, this is sort of far from obvious um, because sometimes 
people don't really think about cryptography too much, but the one of the analogies that I like is, you know, imagine you've built a house and imagine you've built that house over the last 30 years and the house is there, it's standing, uh, everything is, is working as it should. And someone comes and says, um, you know what, the nails that you've used for that house, they're, they're gonna disintegrate at some point in the future. Do you know where, you, where all the nails are? And cryptography is a little bit like that um, because actually even understanding where and how you're using cryptography in a, in a complex enterprise, that is, that is a really good starting point. Um, and it takes a lot of time to, to be able to do that takes a lot of time um, and there are a lot of challenges in, in doing that. Uh, this is why one of the things that IBM has been doing is trying to automate some of that process to be able to get that information. Um, we've also been standardizing some of the um, some of the sort of how the information is actually ingested. Uh, so some of the work that we've been doing with the cryptography bill of material really is to try and get to a point where it's easier to gain that information than it is today, because today we don't have a standard way where our vendors are saying, OK, you have bought this. Here is how the, this is how we're using the cryptography. Um, so there are a lot of challenges to be able to get an understanding of where cryptography is being used, which means it can also be challenging to understand what the impact of that cryptography being broken is going to be for the for the organization. So before you can even start to go and start to fix things, you need to really understand where where do the risks lie what what is what is the actual threat where what what are the things that you need to start working on um as a priority and what are maybe the things that are that are lower priority um so that would be my recommendation would be to start getting on top of of the the cryptography estate um, start looking at what are the, the things that you want to protect as a priority. So the first one would be harvest now, decrypt later. What are the things, what are the, um, the mitigation or remediation solutions that I can put in place today to ensure that um, my data is not harvested, for example, or sen sensitive data with long shelf life is not harvested. Some things may not matter. So just because something is vulnerable doesn't mean we need to fix it. Uh, we want to be fixing the things that are really important. Yeah, there's a prioritization of you know which nails are going to disappear faster. Are those nails that adjoin on the house? You know, it's that's a that's a wonderful analogy. I, well, I, on those nails, so not to give people nightmares who are listening to this, um, but where is cryptography being used in our daily life that people who are not involved in this would be surprised? about it because people might be listening to this who have no impact no in no crypto experience no quantum experience going ah that doesn't affect me and obviously yeah. it does but where well i think i mean ultimately i think cryptography affects us all uh whether we realize it or not so you know who um you know who's used their phone today um who's gone and done some online banking or who has sent an email or logged into logged into um you know made an amazon purchase um so these are all areas that ultimately cryptography is is involved so is there I anything in our digital life that us. isn't anything in our digital life that isn't so if your, your digital life is based on cryptography yes well, here's the here's the philosophy too that's happening right now is that 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 most people rely on these platforms, these apps, these organizations to oh they've got it all encrypted. It says right here like all of my stuff is encrypted on WhatsApp. It's great, but you know then what if that team is not you know staying on top of where the disappearing nails are, and then it starts to trickle down to people um, with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think um, yeah, there's an uh, there's almost like an offloading of risk on the individual level, I think, to the platforms, wouldn't you say? I, I think, I mean, I think there is a risk that people just think that it's somebody else's problem. Um, 
and you know and and even with some enterprises i think you know one solution could be well my vendors are just going to take care of it so i can just sit back and relax um which could be an approach um i'm not sure that it would be an approach that i would be comfortable with because ultimately we you know our vendor the vendors will will do what um what the the companies that are buying their services require and if that require if that market demand isn't coming in loud and clear they might be sort of they they might think that it's okay to um to postpone that so i think there's a, there's we all have a responsibility to make sure that the things that we're responsible for that we're accountable for that that these things are really happening and then if the vendors are doing what they what what we expect them to do then that's great but i don't think it's something where we can just sit back relax and rely on somebody else to to take ownership of that problem um as individuals um one of the things that that certainly i'll be doing is looking at the platforms that I'm using and looking at what they're doing to protect my data against a quantum threat or or any other threat. I mean, quantum threat is is the example we're using here, but that would equally apply to any other threat that that might be coming. So if we think of our online banking, um, I would want to know that HSBC is doing the right things and and you know and I've used that as an example and actually HSBC are probably one of the most proactive um proactive companies in in this space but I think we all have a responsibility to take ownership for this as a risk this is just um one last question before I hand it over to Jeremy for the closing thoughts and this might be a very short answer it might be a very long answer but you talk about handing over responsibility to somebody else and so we're in the ai era of handing over all our tasks to ai how if at all has the explosion the acceleration of ai affected how nist and ibm and of your collaborators are thinking about this are you using ai to help you are you using is ai hindering you has ai made it more urgent to get this done like how is ai fitting into the nist fitting into post quantum um, cryptography world i mean I, I, it that's a good question ultimately ai is a very powerful technology as is quantum and um you know in the words of spider-man um with great power comes great responsibility i mean these are all technologies that are hugely powerful have huge amount of potential to really change things for good um but they also have the the ability to be used for nefarious purposes and I think that's something that we need to accept that that is the case for all powerful technologies. Um, so AI in particular, when we talk about the PQC transformation journey, uh, we're using AI as part of the work we do around um, automation and around being able to interpret data and around being able to make that transformation um, more efficient, more effective, more accurate. Um, so that's the part where you know we're using AI to to help, um, and we're using AI to make things make things better. But equally, I think we can look at what does AI mean for security, and there are people that will be using these technologies for nefarious purposes. And we need to be prepared for that. And we need to take a responsible, a responsible view um, of how these technologies can be used. And this is sort of, this also goes back. So I'm part of the IBM quantum team. Our mission statement is on one side to bring useful quantum computing to the world. On the other, it's to make the world quantum safe. So I think we, you know, we need to be looking at all of these technologies under this this sort of dual dual hat, if you like. 
how do we um, how do we leverage them for the for the good that they can bring, but also how do we protect ourselves against the potential damage that they can do? I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I, I noticed maybe even a tinge of worry in your voice when I said AI, as if like there's something that it's it's so incredibly powerful that yes, we need to move quicker than we were. Well, I it's. Uh... I guess it's it's down to, you know, all technology can be used for good and for not so good, and yeah. I think AI is is one of the, it it is one of those technologies that does you know does create some concern. Um, so because ultimately it is moving so quickly, and because sometimes um, you know we tend to take a little bit of a you know the the power of the technology is not necessarily um, understood, and that's where things could potentially go go wrong. And you know, and we've seen, and I think AI is a is a very good example of that. So that's not to say that AI is bad, because I think AI is again, it's you know hugely powerful and can be hugely beneficial. Um, but we do need to be careful um, and make sure that you know we look at we look at both sides of the equation before sort of jumping into into some of these things and that's why i think that the quantum threat um, aspect that's something that actually a lot of really clever people have been looking at for a long long time that's why we're in the position we're in where we've actually got standards today that uh can help us to to move forward towards a, a quantum safe um quantum safe situation um, and that's why sometimes when people say, well, can I wait? Well, yeah, of course you can wait. Should you wait is another question. 100% agree. Uh, so disruptors and curious minds, some some takeaways that are swirling around in my brain. Um, you know, as you're a user of these technologies, using apps and platforms, you know, as Lori said, you know, start to consider what they're doing in a post-quantum world or to prepare for a post-quantum world as an individual and businesses, IT departments, CTOs, listen, you can either get started on this, I think, or you can start deleting all of your data and printing, you know, hard copies of it, stuffing it in a, you know, lockable <laughs> shelf somewhere, uh, and then crossing your fingers. So, uh, yeah, so that's well, you're back to thinking on paper, Jeremy. That's what that's right. We're going back to analog. You know, we're <laughs> we're all going to have a, a spot in this. So, um, Laurie, this has been a fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed uh, your insights and and your work is is going to lead to some uh, very helpful things for people and companies down the road. Uh, let's let's finish with our carryover question. So next week, you know, speaking of AI, next week we're talking to a studio, some executives from some large um, creation houses that uh, are using AI to create animation, what would be your question for them you know, related to anything? It doesn't have to relate to security or cryptography or anything, but what would you leave for them as a handoff? Um, well, I'm going to continue with the theme that, that we've been discussing here today. And I would ask them, um, you know, I think the entertainment business is a really interesting one because of all of the sort of the copyright implications and, um, so you know what what are they what are they have they started thinking about their transition to post quantum cryptography? Excellent. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, they're, that's they're, a, they're, they're all about the kind of new IP. So the copyright question is very pertinent for what we'll be speaking about. Mark, yeah. tell them about the book club, and we'll we'll get on our way here. Do you know what? For the first time, I think in 120, however many episodes, I don't have a book next to me because I was in a We've got a book club. There we go, where we read books that have stood the test of time, books that will change your mind. We are the rebellion to the 15 minute book summary. We are the rebellion to that. We're going to read 150 books in a week. We're going to read one book very, very thoroughly together and then bounce our ideas around to try to understand, to read between the lines, to make sense of books and we're reading as jeremy showed you or if you're just listening to this quantum supremacy by michu kaku who still hasn't agreed to come on the show by the way uh still working on that one you got any that. connects <laughs> ibm you have any connects to him and the next we'll see book, what we can do ah and the next book will be nexus by um 
uh, Noah Harari, you, you and Noah Harari, and I don't think he'll be coming on the show either unless you know somebody there. But um, yeah, join the book club, thinking on paper to X, Y, Z, like, subscribe. And Laurie, thanks for joining again. Um, we'll put out some notes. And if you have anything, any links or anything you want to send Mark, we have a great post-show wrap up that we do. But thanks for joining. Uh, audience, be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you for 